We've talked about how people use the attribution process to understand the experiences of others, and we know that these attributions are at times inaccurate, but is the same true for attributions of the self? Can we misunderstand or misattribute our own experiences? According to Schachter and Singer, there are times when we may misattribute our emotions to the wrong cause. Schachter and Singer uh, argued that the emotional experience is comprised of, of two distinct factors, that we have the physical or physiological component and we have the cognitive component, and that this is essential to understanding the nature of our emotional experience. Because if we look at uh, various emotional experiences, uh, then we find that the underlying physiological reaction is virtually indistinguishable. And so it's the cognitive interpretation or the cognitive label that provides us with um, the variety of discrete emotions uh, that we experience. Because if we look at the, the physical underpinnings, we find that um, how our body responds across different emotional states uh, is largely undifferentiated. And so we may have uh, an increase in heart rate, an increase in respiration rate, dilation of the pupils. We may feel uh, a little jittery. Uh, we may have sweaty palms. And that uh, this could be our physical reaction, regardless of uh, whether we're feeling excitement or fear or surprise or even sexual attraction. And so it's the cognitive label that distinguishes between those various emotional states and provides meaning to this physical response of the body, right, that helps us interpret, okay, well, this increase in heart rate, this increase in respiration rate is fear uh, versus sexual attraction. Um, now, Schechter and Singer argued that in the vast majority of cases, uh, this attribution process uh, goes according to plan, that we are accurate in regards to the nature of our emotional state, that we're not making a, an incorrect or um, misattribution here. Because in the vast majority of cases, the salient cues in our environment uh, provide a clear-cut answer. Right? If I have an increase in heart rate and respiration rate, and I look out and I see a snake, then I provide a cognitive label that says, well, this increase in heart rate is fear. Versus if I look out and I see uh, a very attractive person, then I may think, uh, well, this increase in heart rate and respiration rate is, is maybe excitement over seeing this really attractive person. When the cues in our environment are clear, this cognitive labeling process works just fine. But what happens when the salient cues in our environment are ambiguous? Schachter and Singer manipulated the ambiguity of situational cues to study the attribution of emotion. Participants were provided with the cover story that the study was an investigation of a trial medication to improve vision. They were told that they would be given the trial medication uh, when in reality, they were given a shot of epinephrine or adrenaline um, or a saline solution. So the saline solution was the control condition. So we'll focus on those given the epinephrine or otherwise known as adrenaline. The idea is that those participants will have a physical response, an increase in arousal. So the component one of the two component process of emotion. For those injected with epinephrine, the researchers then vary the accuracy of the information provided. So some of our participants, after receiving the injection of epinephrine, were told that there are known side effects of the vision medication and that they should expect an increase in heart rate, um, that they would breathe more rapidly, that they may feel jittery or on edge. 
So all things that we would expect if someone has just been given a shot of adrenaline. Right? So they are told exactly what to expect in terms of their bodily response to this medication. The other half of participants who were injected with the epinephrine uh, were either told that there were no known side effects of the vision medication, that it would affect vision and nothing else, or they were actively misled. And we'll lump these two conditions together. Some are explicitly told uh, just the opposite of what is going to happen to them physically. So they're told that known uh, side effects of the drug are that people feel drowsy, uh, tired, or lethargic, um, which is the exact opposite of what someone is going to feel after they've just been given a shot of adrenaline. But we're going to combine um, the no information and the inaccurate information uh, conditions together and compare those to the condition in which they received accurate information regarding the physical effects of this injection. Participants are told that it would take a few moments for the effects of the vision medication to um, kick in. And so they were led to a waiting room to wait while the medication took effect. And then once it did, they would be given their vision test. And so here is our next manipulation. In that waiting room, our participant is exposed to a confederate, someone that they believe is another naive participant taking part in this vision study, when in fact they are an actor working with the researchers, and they have been instructed to act in scripted ways, depending upon the condition that the participant is assigned to. So, in some instances, our participant walks into the room and they encounter a confederate that is acting very happy and excited and euphoric. And so this is just a, a really fun guy uh, who's living his best life. Um, he's really happy. He takes paper and makes paper airplanes and gets the participant to join in and fly paper airplanes with him. Uh, he's shooting rubber bands across the room. He finds a hula hoop behind the door and starts hula hooping. Uh, so just a really fun, energetic guy. Um, or our participant may walk into the room and encounter the angry confederate. And so this confederate is really upset and angry about what a waste of time this experiment is, um, that it's taking too long. He complains, he takes his survey and crumples it up and throws it on the ground. So our dependent variable of interest is what is the emotional state of the participant? How do they respond to emotional questionnaire? And what is their behavior in the context of that waiting room after being exposed to our confederate? And so this is a breakdown of some of our key findings. So if we look at those participants who were given a shot of adrenaline and then provided with accurate information in regards to what to expect with their physical response. So these are people who are told explicitly, you should expect an increase in heart rate, to breathe more rapidly, to feel jittery and on edge. And that, of course, is how they feel. They look out, they see this really happy, euphoric confederate who is flying paper airplanes, and hula hooping in the corner, and they think, well, you know, that, that guy's really having a great time, uh, awesome for him, uh, but I just kind of want to, to do my study and get my credits and get out of here, right? Uh, so, observing the euphoric confederate had no effect on the participant's self-reported emotional state. So they thought, well, he's really euphoric, he's really happy, but me, not so much. The same thing for our participants who are given a shot of adrenaline or epinephrine, accurate information, and observe the angry confederate. Participants observe the angry confederate, but that angry confederate has no effect on their self-reported emotional state. So they uh, have the increase 
in arousal, right? They are feeling jittery on edge, but they think, well, that's a result of the medication that I was given. I don't know why this guy over here is so angry and being a jerk, but I feel on edge because of the medication. We see something very different when we uh, observe our participants who are given the shot of adrenaline or epinephrine and provided with no information or actively misled in regards to what to expect of their physical response. And so here they have that same increase in heart rate, uh, increase in respiration rate, they feel jittery and on edge, but they can't attribute it to the medication that they've just received. They observe the euphoric confederate who's happy and hula hooping, and then when asked, how do you feel, what is your current emotional state? Observing the euphoric confederate has an impact on their self-reported mood. So they are reporting that they feel happy and euphoric. If we look at the group of participants who are given a shot of adrenaline, no information or actively misled as to what to expect, they observe the angry confederate. Not only do they then report that they themselves are angry, they even act angry. So they join in with the angry confederate in crumpling up their survey and throwing it on the ground or complaining. And so Schachter and Singer found that when the situation was ambiguous, when they had this physical response, this increase in heart rate, respiration rate, they felt jittery, and they had no ready explanation as to why they felt this way. They naturally looked to their environment and the salient cues in their environment to understand this physical response, and that what was salient in their environment was this confederate. And so the confederate had a strong impact on how they attributed this physical response and it had a strong impact on their self-reported mood. But that in the unambiguous situations, here they're having the same physical response, but they know exactly why they have this increase in arousal, why they feel jittery and on edge. They don't have to look to the environment for an interpretation, for a label. And so therefore, this confederate in their environment had no effect on their self-reported mood. And so we'll only have this misattribution of arousal, according to Schachter and Singer, when the environment is ambiguous when we are unsure as to the cause of our physical response. And so the question becomes, well, can this happen in real life? Schachter and Singer created this hyper-controlled artificial laboratory environment to elicit misattribution of arousal, but can something similar happen out in the real world? So researchers have conducted field experiments on misattribution of arousal. In this particular study, male individuals were approached by an attractive female experimenter. The setting, the location of this field study was a, a park, uh, this very kind of beautiful, natural, uh, environment. Uh, it was a ravine with a bridge crossing the ravine. And this location was selected because we have a very high off the ground suspension bridge crossing over a, a jagged ravine. It's very beautiful, but in crossing this bridge, um, it's a suspension bridge. It kind of sways a bit as you're walking across it. Uh, you could look over the edge and see that if you were to fall off this bridge, uh, you would fall to your death. So it does present a somewhat fear-inducing type of experience. But Right in the middle of this bridge, males who are crossing are approached by an attractive female experimenter who asks them to take part 
in a short study of the effects of scenic exposure on creativity. So this is our experimental condition. Our control condition uh, is one in which instead of being approached right in the middle of this tall, scary suspension bridge, they are approached after safely crossing to the other side of the ravine. They are on solid ground and they are walking towards a park bench. So in the bridge condition, we should have some degree of anxiety or fear. And uh, in our control condition, they're on solid ground. There should be you know, no fear involved in this particular setting. So our cover story again is the effects of scenic exposure on creativity. Our male participants are presented with what's called uh, the TAT or the thematic apperception test. These are ambiguous images in which participants are asked to generate a story to correspond with the image. After generating the story, Researchers coded this story for themes and uh, rated the amount of sexual imagery in the story. After generating the story, the female researcher would tell the male participant, thank you so much for participating in the study today. Uh, here is my contact information, my phone number. In case you have any follow-up questions later on, uh, feel free to call me. The dependent variables of interest for our researcher was the amount of sexual imagery in the story that they told and the likelihood that they called the very attractive female researcher later uh, to, to talk to her further. And so that phone number actually went to the laboratory so that our researchers could determine uh, who is calling. Is it the males who are approached in the middle of the scary bridge, or is it those who are approached by the park bench? What the researchers found was that those who were approached in the middle of the scary bridge uh, had significantly more sexual imagery in the story that they told and were significantly more likely to call the attractive female researcher later, suggesting that potentially they misattributed the increase in heart rate and respiration rate, uh, that kind of jittery feeling that they felt due to the fear and anxiety of being on this bridge, to what was right in front of them, uh, the attractive female researcher. They misattributed it to sexual attraction rather than to fear. Uh, and so this has kind of led to, to some recommendations uh, for individuals if you wanted to take advantage of misattribution of arousal. And uh, we do find that these are very often popular date uh, activities or locations. Uh, people who go on dates to get coffee, the caffeine, increasing arousal may be misattributed to attraction towards your date. Uh, that very often you find uh, people will go see scary movies uh, for a date or do other types of uh, adrenaline or fear-inducing types of activities.